<laughs> webinar, Elevating an Equitable Healthcare System in honor of National Minority Health Month. To begin our program, let me introduce Ted Henson, NAC's Director for Health Center Growth and Development. Ted has some information to share about the work NAC is doing to support community health workers. Ted? Thank you, Rachel. It is truly an honor to be a part of today's conversation alongside renowned organizations such as APCHO, the NAACP, and UNITAS US. For community health centers, health equity means that everyone has the right to well being, health, and health care, and that no one is disadvantaged because of socially determined circumstances. Uh, next slide, please. These social circumstances or social determinants of health are the conditions and the environments in which people live, learn, work, play, age that affect a wide range of quality of life, health outcomes, and risk. Health centers know these issues well. At NAC, advancing health equity and addressing social determinants of health is fundamental to the work we do. NAC's value transformation framework provides a conceptual model for health centers in advancing towards value with value defined by the quintuple aim goals, which are listed on your screen. The framework organizes health center systems in three domains and 15 change areas, and health equity is a foundational principle for each change area. I've been asked to quickly highlight a few ways in which NAC supports health centers to provide enabling services and leverage community health workers. So the next slide, please. The CHW workforce is a priority of the Biden administration for responding to COVID-19 and advancing health equity. Just last month, HHS announced that it will provide $300 million for community health workers to support COVID-19 prevention and control. NAC is currently actively partnering with organizations to support the CHW workforce. Just last month at our 2021 Policy and Issues Forum, NAC highlighted the work of the National Association of Community Health Workers in advancing CHW policy, funding, and training opportunities. NAC is also partnering at, with MHP Salud at, on a session at next week's Ag Worker Conference on how community health workers are key to screening for social determinants of health. NAC also currently offers a learning collaborative on developing CHW workflows. This is a new learning collaborative and it brings together CHWs and Health Center Control Network staff to focus on the role of CHWs in COVID-19 vaccine, patient education, assessment of barriers, and vaccine distribution. NAC has also partnered with state primary care associations to highlight CHW models. For example, we highlighted the Alaska Primary Care Association in a case study on their state's CHW apprenticeship program. NAC has also partnered with the Michigan Primary Care Association, both on a session at last month's PI conference, but also on an issue brief on health center models for cross training uh, CHWs as outreach and enrollment assisters. These resources can be found on the Health Center Resource Clearinghouse, which is www.healthcenterinfo.org. In terms of workforce, it's important to note that while we talk about community health workers, what we're really talking about is community health work. And at health centers, we refer to this work as enabling services. And these are the non-clinical services that promote access to healthcare and improve health outcomes. According to 2019 UDS data, health centers employed over 24,000 enabling services staff. This includes CHWs, but we know that that work is diverse and so are the titles. They may also include promotoras, health educators, outreach workers, navigators, case managers, transportation staff, interpreters, and eligibility assisters. Speaking of which, NAC currently leads an outreach and enrollment learning collaborative, which I have the pleasure of leading, and it convenes eligibility staff, assisters, navigators, and CHWs to discuss targeted outreach and marketing strategies and best practices for enrollment and the healthcare exchanges. In terms of social determinants of health, NAC is a leading partner alongside APSHO on PREPARE. PREPARE is a national effort to help health centers collect the data they need to better understand and act on their, health, their patients' social determinants of health. PREPARE also asks individuals about a range of determinants of health, from housing to employment, physical and emotional safety to food security and more. Health centers may leverage community health workers to implement PREPARE to screen patients for their social determinants of health. Then, as valued members of the health center care team, community health workers may follow up with patients to provide the social interventions that improve health outcomes and move the needle on health inequity. Lastly, in terms of policy, the data from PREPARE and UDS can drive the advocacy work that we do at NAC at the federal and state levels to address root causes of health. This can include advocating for funding and reimbursements for things like CHW activities, uh, particularly around vaccine distribution and equity. I personally have had the pleasure of partnering closely with CMS and the Centers for Consumer Information Oversight, which oversees healthcare.gov, 
on webinars and listening sessions to support health centers outreach and enrollment efforts, efforts which are often conducted by CHWs. So it's been an honor to share a few of these resources with you today and to be a voice in this movement toward health equity. Feel free to contact me directly at thenson.nac.org with any questions and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thanks for reminding us, Ted, of these great resources for health centers and that we still have a lot of work to do in terms of achieving health equity for all. Now, we know that health centers, primary care associations, health center controlled networks, and NAC do not focus on equity in healthcare one month out of the year. Achieving equity in healthcare drives our work each and every day. Indeed, the community health center model grew out of the civil rights movement and the belief that access to quality, culturally relevant health care is necessary for human dignity. That guides health centers to this day. For us, health care is not merely a service to be commodified. It is a fundamental human right. So, how does NAC go beyond the rhetoric to deliver on that promise? As we celebrate NAC's 50th anniversary, we are more committed than ever to bringing the civil rights perspective to our work, and the work of health centers across the nation. That is why we are excited to bring today's discussion with leaders from key civil rights organizations. The Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, or APCHO, the NAACP, and Unidos US, formerly National Council of La Raza. With last week's verdict in the trial of George Floyd's murder and the health disparities laid bare by the pandemic, the nation has reached an inflection point in our national consciousness on equity. What is the role of health centers in tackling the continued injustices within our most vulnerable communities and creating a truly equitable healthcare system? Well, yesterday we got to listen in on the conversation that was had between NAC's president and CEO, Tom Van Coverden, APCHO's executive director, Jeffrey Caballero, NAACP's Director of Learning and Impact, Dr. Marjorie Innocent, and Unidos US President and CEO, Janet Murguia. Let's listen into that conversation. Our thanks to each of you for joining us today. Let me begin with the conversation by asking each of you to speak briefly about your organization and your support and your advocacy that you do in the same communities where we serve with so many medically underserved and minority populations. Can we start, Janet, with you? Of course, thank you, Tom. And it's wonderful to be part of this panel with so many incredible partners. Look, at Unidos US, our mission is to promote opportunities for the Latino community, but more importantly, to address systemic inequities that have existed uh, since we were founded in 1968. We are 53 plus years old and our pursuit of helping champion the Latino community and others who face those systemic inequalities is at the forefront of our mission. Uh, we do this in partnership with our national network of affiliates, nearly 300 community-based organizations who together serve millions of families every day. Among the core issues that we tackle are education, workforce development, immigration, civic participation, housing, and of course, health and access to health care. We have focused a great deal on health care in recent years, given the fact that so many communities of color, including the Latino community, remain the groups most likely to lack health insurance in this country and that are a higher risk or diseases as diabetes and heart uh, diseases. And that's why we've been very involved both on the development and implementation of the Affordable Care Act. And we recognize that thanks to the Affordable Care Act, 4 million more Latinos among others have had access to health insurance for the first time and have been able to address the larger percentage of Hispanics who are uninsured while we still have more work to do. So our affiliates, uh, basically our community-based organizations have been a big part of that work and we support them in this effort by making sure that our language and cultural competencies 
are addressed as we engage these different communities, including the Latino community. Because what we have learned is that unless you're engaging them in the proper way, in a way that is making information and, and services accessible, you're not really connecting in the way that you should. So we're very proud of many of the affiliates that are part of our network, including uh, community-based organizations like AltaMed in, in Los Angeles, led by Castro de la Rocha. I also know we've got wonderful uh, affiliates on the other coast, including uh, Urban Health Plan and Institute with pa Paloma Izquierdo Hernandez. So for us, those are just a sampling of some of the community-based organizations like Mary Center here in Washington, D.C., led by Maria Gomez or uh, the California Primary Care Association led by Carmela Castellano Garcia. We're very proud that not only are we engaging this network in programs and services, but we've also leveraged their voice for advocacy as it relates to inclusion of policies and resources, most recently in the, uh, in the American Rescue Plan, where collectively we were able to come together and really secure more than $6 billion in funding. And that's what's at the heart of our partnership and collective with these community-based organizations. But I also know it's reflected in this uh, partnership that we share with so many wonderful organizations represented here today. Thank you very much. Dr. Janet. Thank you I'm again sorry. so much. Dr. Marjorie, with the NAACP, with all the great work you do, I'm so sorry. You're Go good, ahead. you're good. You're fine, Tom. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And uh, Janet, thank you so much for, for kicking us off on the, on the right note, as always. Absolutely fantastic. So very similarly to, uh, to what Janet shared, for um, 100 and, can I get my math right? 112 years now, since 1909. The NAACP, as uh, many of you uh, likely know, has really been at the forefront of lifting up, protecting uh, civil rights in this country. And this is, you know, uh, at, especially at that time, an effort that started largely with African Americans uh, for reasons that, that should be clear. And over time, uh, while our work does continue to focus primarily on uh, what we call the greater black community, we absolutely work very much in partnership uh, with our um, Latinx, our uh, um, Asian Pacific Islander American uh, native uh, populations as well, because what we understood, um, we've understood literally for a better part of, a, of, a, of a, uh, more than a century, uh, frankly, at this point, is that the need for people to have basic rights that ensure their health, their well-being, that provides them with opportunity is essential not just for individuals and for communities, but for the nation as a whole. And the reality is we are a nation of many. <laughs> We're not a nation of any you know, particular group. We can go down the list of, you know, uh, you know, by, by sequence, if you will, but that ultimately gets us away from the larger conversation, which is that we are a nation of many. And we all have a very important role to play in building this country and have played this role and absolutely continue to play that role even in the midst of um, denial of basic rights. And so from our standpoint, as Janet said, it's been very, very clear that health is, um, is really essential. And in particular, uh, what we now know, of course, as uh, primary and preventive care, right? So there's no real um, logical reason <laughs> to wait for people to get really sick or to get near death to address health. We really should be looking at what is necessary to maintain health on the front end, keep people as healthy and robust as possible so that they can be as productive and healthy and successful as possible. Conceptually, the model doesn't, does, does not um, defy logic. The reality is what it is that happens or does not happen in terms of what's offered to people, right? That's really where the, the conversation lies. And you know, from, from our standpoint, between the extraordinary work that community health centers um, have been doing for, we now know, right, for, uh, 50 years in ensuring basic rights in terms of health, in terms of other basic social needs, 
that really help you know collectively to to um, um, ensure well-being for people has been nothing short of remarkable. What has been um, a shame, and I'll say uh, on a personal level, a sin and a shame, is the extent to which they have been able to do this work for a lot of them on a shoestring budget. Such important work is really critical and really should be at the forefront of what actually um, is insured and is um, provided, if you will, right, within all communities and in terms of, you know, what's needed uh, to ensure um, infrastructure, to ensure staffing, and to ensure everything that is really needed ultimately to help keep people as healthy as possible. That is absolutely part of what we advocate for um, at the association. And along with that, we certainly consider what's needed in terms of uh, basic income, what's needed in terms of quality education. We view all of these elements as um, central, if you will, as the building blocks of individuals, of families and communities within our country. That's absolutely, that will continue to be uh, very much a, a critical piece of the work that we do. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeff, uh, Caviato, our dear friend. Uh, Tom, be uh, Tom yes. before, before you move to Jeff, and I wanna hear from Jeff too, let, I just really wanna add one point that Marjorie has kind of laid the foundation for. And, and for me, it's also this point that for so many uh, underserved communities, vulnerable communities, disenfranchised communities, really the community health centers are an essential uh, safety net for our communities. And, you know, of our network, I know at least 25 are, are, are federally qualified health centers. What makes them indispensable, just building on Marjorie's point about it's not just making sure they have access to care, but it's preventative care that they need access to. One of the things that pandemic has demonstrated for us is that, you know, uh, we need everybody to get this care in, in a public health crisis. And for us in the Latino community, that means undocumented people who have been called on to serve in so many essential roles to keep our economy going, to keep food on the table. And the best sources of care in most instances for, for those who are working the hardest and yet most vulnerable have been uh, the community health centers. And for us in our community, I know people draw a line and, and we have to work out the politics of immigration, but in a public health crisis, and as it relates to public health in general, we have to make sure everyone gets care. And so, for us, uh, serving the needs of the Latino families, including those who are undocumented, is essential. And I just say the, the role that community health centers play is, is really invaluable in this moment. Thanks, Jeff, for letting me get that word in, and Tom, for letting me kind of crowd in there real quick. Thank and you. And thank, thank both of you for saying that and making a point, uh, as I'm sure uh, our next speaker will, will do, but it's such an important point to make. Uh, the people who pick our crops and our food and work in the meat cutting plants and and everything and cleaning everything that you know it's just uh, yeah indispensable to everything it is that we are doing we cannot forget them jeffrey we've been working together for a number of years uh, mr cavalera with apcho uh, but would you give us your perspective please thank you uh, i just wanted to thank my colleagues that chair this call as well and for NAC for inviting after to participate in this conversation. Um, just to add to Janet and Marjorie's point, um, the health center program has been incredibly critical, vital to Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Um, currently, uh, health centers serve about a million and a half Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. And, and actual member health centers actually serve one in three of the Asian Americans and one in four of the Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in the health center program. Um, but with regards to the population in particular, as some of you know, um, you know, the Asian American Pacific Islander is not a monolithic uh, community. Um, that's really the big challenge and, and the benefit and the gift 
that this community has to offer in that there's more than 50 different racial ethnic groups within the community and 100 different languages that communities in this population come from. And, and that poses a very big challenge for providers. And actual member centers uh, are, are those health centers that have been serving this population. And we are doing what we can to demonstrate those effective practices, those best practices and, and examples that these providers have and sharing it with the other providers so that we can all take on um, and address the challenge of, of addressing um, the diversity and the language needs within this community. Uh, one thing that you all might already be familiar with in that in the last 10 years, Asian Americans uh, have been the fastest growing population in this country and primarily due to new immigration um, uh, over the last 10 years. And so that really poses new challenges that uh, we as a country, uh, the, the various states that our communities have settled in, and they've settled in states where we've not settled in before. Uh, uh, and, and so those, those communities are learning how to serve this population for the very first time and responding to COVID or a crisis like COVID with, this, with a new population is a, a very difficult experience. And that's why it was really vital for organizations like ours and the other health centers out there that have experience serving this community be able to share those best practices uh, and, and those examples uh, to make sure that we can respond to this, uh, this, this challenge uh, as a nation. Um, you know, but it is notable that uh, a couple of advocacy victories that I just wanted to share. And Tom, we've worked with, your, with, with you and your, all your staff. I, I can't even mention how many staff members that, not, that we partner with to get many of these victories in place. But uh, notable, notable victories is the reversal of public charge. Um, you know, this is a challenge that we have taken on the last three years together. And, and then for our, our COFO migrant communities, restoring Medicaid eligibility so that all the communities that need for our Pacific Islander COFO migrants, are, they are now able to access Medicaid resources and receive the care that they all much uh, really need. But lastly, I just wanted to note that the last three years, APCHO has also been partnering with Pacific Islander community leaders uh, to establish a Pacific Islander Center of Primary Care Excellence. Uh, this was really trying to help build the primary care access uh, and, and support the development of capacity to serve Pacific Islander communities, both in the Pacific, in Hawaii, and in the continent. And these communities have been responding quite incredibly over the last year to help partner with our health centers and other community-based organizations to make sure that Pacific Islanders are able to receive the care that they need to respond to COVID. So again, thank you um, for this opportunity, Tom. And I look forward to our further discussions. Already, question uh, number two then for everybody. Uh, from day one, this administration has talked about prioritizing health equity. And with our COVID uh, vaccination campaign uh, with the health centers and the nation, there is no question that vulnerable and hard to reach populations uh, and communities were prioritized, uh, at least in theory. Uh, how do you think we're doing uh, as a country when it comes to vaccinating communities of color? Uh, and uh, what has been uh, the frontline experience that you've seen and uh, the messaging uh, that you are hearing? Can I ask each of you that? And, and uh, Jenna, let's go back and we'll keep the same order then and go through it and ask each that question. Thank you, Tom. Um, look, there's no question that the vaccination process has not uh, been nearly as successful with communities of color than the overall population. I know there have been some improvements, but uh, the percentage of, of, of Blacks and Latinos who receive the vaccine still lag behind the overall population. And I know that's also true for the Asia Pacific American Islander community as well. You know, we're all celebrating the 200 million vaccine milestone 
since the start of the Biden administration. And I do give him and his administration a lot of credit for uh, raising awareness around equity and equitable distribution. But honestly, we have a lot more work to be done. Uh, according to the latest CDC data, only 12% of Latinos and Latinas have received at least one of the doses compared to 64% of whites. Uh, we do know that whites are 1.6 times as likely as blacks or, or Latinos to have received at least one dose in 43 states. And I think we're recognizing that there are reasons for that. First, it is true that there is some hesitancy to get the vaccine among Latinos and other communities of color. That is true. We conducted a poll in partnership with Univision that showed about a third of Latinos are still reluctant to get the vaccine. However, what is also true is that many in our community want more information on where to go to to get a vaccine when they are ready. And when it comes to making a vaccine appointment, 17% say they have no idea how to sign up for the vaccine. And another 11% say they have tried, uh, but were unable to make an appointment. And many of the folks in our community polled have also heard false rumors and disinformation against uh, vaccination, including the effectiveness uh, in preventing becoming sick or dying. And I do believe that we uh, understand that some of those challenges exist. That's why we at Unidos US, I know NAACP at NAP show ha have partnered uh, to participate in both public and private sectors so that we can have appropriate information and outreach campaigns to provide accurate uh, and culturally appropriate information that will dispel those concerns about the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. We do need to acknowledge that it's valid for folks to have concerns. Marjorie knows, we know, there's a long history of unfortunately testing uh, medically uh, different experiments in communities of color. It's natural for some to feel some hesitancy, but with the right information delivered in a language and culturally competent way, we can address a lot of those concerns. So that's why Unidos US, I know uh, NAACP and others are very much involved in education and information campaigns. And we're partnering uh, with the community health centers to make sure that that information in community is being delivered appropriately. So uh, I think, you know, kudos to the Biden administration for working and mobilizing to get the vaccine uh, made available, but we've got more work to do in equitably distributing the vaccine and getting more accurate data so that we know how uh, it can be delivered even more effectively in the months ahead. Dr. Marjorie, uh, I'd love to hear from you, the NAACP, please. No, absolutely. Uh, once again, Janet, kudos. And basically what she said, um, the only, the, just a couple of things I, I want to I want to add here. I think it's important to note, just to state for for the record, that as Janet said, the current administration has done um, a pretty remarkable job with advancing the availability of the vaccines, with efforts to try to make them, um, you know, more available and working in tandem with with states, obviously, um, you know, to to be able to do this. I think we have to recognize that there was a deficiency, if you will, that they had coming right in. That was not the situation with the development of the vaccines themselves. So the vaccines obviously were ready. <laughs> what was not prepared in tandem with the development of the vaccines in such a way that the two could have been happening, if you will, you know, simult simultaneously in a way that would have been much more um, effective and efficient is in fact, as Janet said, this issue of information and, and messaging, right? So there is, there, there's still the reality that we're talking about a process and some technologies that are very unfamiliar to most people. And the reality is, um, again, as you know, as Janet had, had um, highlighted, when we're talking about the history and in a lot of cases, 
current practice, right, in medical care that leaves people with some damage, <laughs> with uh, perceptions of um, lack of, of, of clarity, lack of transparency, lack of uh, partnership, and even in a lot of cases, lack of real trust that providers really have their best interest at heart. Those same populations, you know, a lot of uh, cases are the ones that are most at risk. I mean, this, you know, the, the narrative cuts across all issues. It cuts across, um, you know, all areas of public health and medical practice. So when we've got this reality, and now it's, come on, we gotta get, we gotta, you know, we gotta take this vaccine. We need you to, you know, be on board here so we can all get back. I'm not quite sure what it is that the, the, you know, where the shock really lies. You know, it's like, okay, got it, thanks. So. <laughs> You know, in terms of the information that's being shared, how clearly it's being shared, how it's being made available, and then the process for actually being able to get the vaccines, as we've heard already. There's been a lot, I live in Washington, DC, and there's been a lot that I can say that has been learned with literally the process of signing up. It's been arguably democratized considerably over the span of, you know, about six to eight weeks. But what it entailed initially when it first happened, put the very populations that were most at risk at even greater risk of not being able to get access to the vaccines. Along those same lines, even some of the efforts to ensure greater um, availability for some of the most vulnerable populations, um, you know, through efforts such as, um, you know, some geocoding, right? Zip, you know, zip code focused efforts, for example weren't necessarily always as successful as they could be. And there were still a lot um, you know, of, uh, of ways that those who absolutely need the vaccines as well, to be clear, everyone needs it, but who were not as much at risk for potentially contracting, having really negative outcomes and dying, were still able to come right in and get the vaccines. You know what, can't totally be bad at them, but the reality is, what it does is not help an already difficult situation with people who don't necessarily feel that these systems have always been, have, have always had their backs, if you will. And now they see all these cracks and loopholes. And as Janet said, you know, in a lot of cases, it's a question of questions still about what's going on and what's actually, you know, um, in the vaccines. But it's also a, I'm looking back to see how all this is playing out to see if the messaging that says, we're really concerned about you, we want you vaccinated, corresponds with the actions that are being taken to make sure that people are being um, um, as safe as possible, if you will, and able to actually get the vaccines. There's also an examination of, um, at a larger level that's happening here that I don't think uh, we should miss and, and certainly should be part of this conversation as well. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Jeffrey. Yes, sir. Uh, me, let me begin with, you know, as you did, Tom, uh, by acknowledging that the uh, the Health Center uh, Vaccine Direct Access Program made a huge difference uh, for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islander communities. And you know, I, I want to acknowledge and thank the leadership at the Bureau at HRSA uh, for really include for including language access uh, as one of the principal risk criteria, along with homelessness and migrant workers, um, when setting up this program. But I sure am pleased that all health centers are now have this program available to them uh, and all communities at risk have access to these vaccines. But before that program started, let me tell you, uh, we know all too well uh, what other providers were struggling with, uh, trying to get access to the vaccines at the state and local level. Um, you know, as a country, uh, systematically, we are still very challenged and struggling with the limited data uh, available at the national, state, and local level. Um, uh, and this has really contributed to quite um, interesting, uniquely experience for Asian Americans um, and Native Hawaiian Pacific calendar populations. And I'll try to separate uh, those unique experiences in, in this talk. For Asian Americans, as I noted, because we were the fastest growing population, over the last 10 years. You know, it wasn't only in states where the population was growing for the first time that it was a challenge. It was also in the places where 
the community has historically been. The growth of the population has been so tremendous that the system has been overwhelmed once, um, once COVID hit. Um, there were just not enough resources to conduct outreach, health education, and vaccination for, 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 for this very diverse community. And it, it was really very innovative strategies that our health centers and many communities out there that are trying to um, implement and address uh, in, in addressing these um, resource challenges that is being experienced. I mean, even last year, uh, you know, at the beginning um, and even in the summer, uh, Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians, because of the limited data, uh, they weren't even recognized as the population that was at risk for COVID. Um, you know, but then the story started to leak out at, from the local level, including how Filipino nurses are only 5% of the nursing workforce, but they contributed to 50% of the mortality among the nursing workforce. That really woke people up when you're losing that much of your, of your nursing workforce. It, they said something is going on here. And, and, and still, you know, to this day, population groups like the Vietnamese Americans and other Southeast Asian groups are still not being adequately recognized and thus inadequately resourced for outreach, health education, and vaccination resources uh, across this country. Uh, so for, for Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, let me paint an even more dreadful picture. Um, for Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, we learned uh, through this COVID crisis that only 18, 18 of the 50 states had collected disaggregated information data about this population. So that means the populations with the highest positivity and mortality rates uh, in those 18 states were invisible, invisible in the 32 states that did not and did not have data on this population. And, and that really posed tremendous challenges for the community where we had so many essential workers that didn't have access to coverage or or relationships with primary care that was really necessary to address the challenges found in that particular community. So, so we still have a long way to go and I do applaud uh, the new, new administration's uh, efforts, but we're, we're only four months into this new administration and we, you know, we really lack action in the months before that. So we have a long way to go. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I agree with you, my dear friend. Um, let me go to uh, the third question. Community health centers uh, have been a big part of the COVID response uh, from testing uh, starting uh, in last March uh, all to uh, vaccinations. Um, according to the latest uh, data, and uh, they do ask for information and data that is uh, up to the White House, I might add, uh, daily and weekly on reports, especially with regard to minorities, on what are the health centers able to do? Uh, yes, it's another major league administrative burden, but it's worth every penny of it. And so uh, again, it's because of you and working together with us that I think those resources were set aside for the health centers to make sure that they got to the people who most often do get overlooked. And I thank all of you for being part of that. Um, I'm showing that we have tested over 10.2 million as of today. Uh, vaccinations, 4,160,181. Um, and uh, completed, that means with two, uh, 2,573,545. Uh, so we're making progress, but still a long way to go to try and get to all of the people that really, really need this, um, especially the racial and ethnic uh, minorities, which comprise over 65% of what the health center population, as you well know. Uh, so uh, all the while uh, we continue in the health centers with all the vaccination activities to continue the basic uh, health care services, prevention, primary care to pregnant women, to first trimester, to regular vaccinations, to the other things uh, for moms and kids and others, uh, as well as behavioral health, which, which became a very significant a problem, as I know many of you know, 
that we had to do and look at innovative ways to try and do that. So I guess my question now is, what other things do you think health centers can do to protect their communities from this pandemic and future threats? Uh, Janet, we'll go back and start with you if we may. Great, thanks, Tom. Uh, let me just uh, mention a, a couple of things. And I guess I wanna make sure that I also build on the fact that you know, we all as uh, organizations through our voice and advocacy really did advocate for uh, targeted funding in the American Rescue Plan Act. And a lot of that was included in the Plan Act uh, that, that created the Health Center COVID-19 vaccine program that provides more vaccines to community health centers and other providers that are trusted by members of our community. We have to make sure implementation, execution of those resources actually reaches those communities. The act also includes billions of dollars for more testing and contact, contact tracing and to provide medical equipment. Another important aspect of the rescue plan is that it guarantees a free vaccine regardless of immigration and health insurance status, which has been a major obstacle. But my bigger point is to make sure that we continue our advocacy around the implementation of those resources getting to where they're supposed to go. That's one. The others I would say is that, look, it is very clear to me, I know to many as part of my network of affiliates, again, many of whom are part of the National Association of Community Health Centers, that as trusted partners, uh, it's really important to engage these community centers, not just in, in access to healthcare and this important information, but what we have found through this pandemic, as difficult and challenging has been, is that there's a holistic approach and lens that these community centers, I think, and others of us in our network understand is more important than ever. And what I have been touched by and impressed by is that in order to mitigate health and social economic impact of COVID on our communities, we've seen many of these centers step up either to directly or indirectly support communities with either referrals or again, working along a safety net of, of organizations to provide food distribution sites to help put food on the table. I know many of our affiliates have referred families to financial counseling uh, sites to support individuals who've lost their jobs, connections to housing and transportation services to stabilize families during this time, outreach and education on the importance of, of, of civic participation and workforce development, you know, healing communities and serving as a safe space as, as we confront racial injustices. Uh, this is not new to our health center movement. And I've been so proud of the way that many have stepped up to look at the whole of these families and individuals that are coming through and understanding that, you know, health care and even the vaccine is one part of many of the, of the aspects of well-being that these families need. And so I would just say, as we continue to respond and recover, we know health uh, centers uh, will continue to be instrumental partners and leaders where equity is front and center in how we serve our community. And we at Wheels US stand in solidarity with the National Association of Community Health Centers, with the NAACP, with APCO, making sure that we can provide that holistic approach and bring equity to the forefront. Thank you so much, Dr. Marjorie. So I'm going to um, fully agree with everything Janet said. I'm going to focus in on one small piece. And this is something I think is, as Janet has said too, actually is important in both directions. It's important for the centers to do. And I think it's important for um, organizations such as uh, those represented here and others that are really, that basically have a, a, a real social justice mission to do. And that is really, I think last year taught us this in a way that was um, incredibly, and I'm talking all of 2020, right? Everything that happened last year really helped to demonstrate this 
in the most concrete way. And that is the importance of really uh, drawing the connection, the clear connection between individual health, public health, and not just people's rights, but in particular uh, voting and even the census. So literally when we look at, I'll use the example of the census first. We, we know we had a lot of challenges last year, right? But when we think about everything that's at stake in the full completion of the census for community health, not just, you know, all, you know, community resources, broadly speaking, but for community health, including funding for um, the establishment of development of expansion of community health centers and what the ramifications are of being able to advance this model for delivering care, for ensuring, um, you know, greater access to an opportunity to actually receive uh, needed uh, social services. It's pretty clear <laughs> that it's really a, a relationship that needs to be uh, that needs to be really, really strong. And as much as it's important, I think, for organizations such as ours to recognize this and to lift this up. When we talk about the census, when the census happens, I think it's also incredibly important for community health centers to uh, think more about themselves in that vein and to really um, uh, market themselves, if you will, right, along those lines. The same goes for elections. And so literally, um, you know, the consequences of uh, voting or not voting, we know uh, what they are. And the reality is in terms of um, you know, really looking at what's necessary to ensure that uh, people's health again and well-being is met and their ability to be able to vote or not. That is actually something that also matters for the success and viability of community health centers in terms of their ability to be able to deliver for populations. So in terms of their ability to, um, you know, really talk about and really make the case for why they matter so much um, through a larger lens, I think it's also something that's incredibly uh, important and something that can be really meaningful in terms of how they can help to strengthen uh, their position and be able to deliver more effectively. Yeah, uh, I, I think you're giving me the cue, Tom, but you are on mute. Uh, I just wanted to note that, but I, I, let me just jump in though and, and, and do acknowledge that, um, you know, I, I've seen our, our health centers do a lot. You know, um, we have health centers in New York, in San Francisco, out in Waianae, that are delivering three to 5,000 vaccines uh, to limited English proficient or culturally uh, disenfranchised communities. Then we, we, then we also have examples of health centers who are delivering um, in mass uh, vaccine sites um, uh, hundreds of second dose vaccines being provided in 10 to 15 languages simultaneously uh, in these mass sites. Um, how, however, this last year, this last year has been unprecedented um, in terms of the challenges that we as a community, us as a nation have faced, you know, not just with language and cultural engagement and food distribution, homelessness, unemployment, and the economic impact in our many of our Chinatowns. But you, know, you, you throw on top of that the anti-Asian violence that has occurred. There's just a lot. There's just a lot to ask of anyone. Um, and, 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 and so we've really been looking at partnerships with community-based organizations quite differently um, over this last year. You know, less so in the crisis orientation and, and maybe more so in what is needed to really develop a system of care with our community-based partners, particularly in being able to coordinate and, and optimize um, the delivery of all the social determinant barriers that our patients are encountering and how can we work with them more effectively and efficiently so that we can be better prepared for when any type of emergency strikes uh, in the future. But, but secondly, um, you know, aside from 
uh, these exploring further these type of relationships, you know, an area that I really believe in, and this is even pre-COVID, um, was the way that health centers uh, and many of our member health centers did this, partnered with community groups in the area to conduct voter registration and get out the vote programs, um, uh, as well as responding to the census. I think in so many areas, but particularly in Georgia, our community was a lot more visible because of the mobilization efforts that have been that they had contributed to uh, over the last election in particular. But we need more of that. And our health centers should be at the center of all of that activity all over this country. Uh, and, and then last but not least that I wanted to just encourage further, though I do not know the secret formula for this, is that um, we've been seeing a lot more allyship between black and brown communities as a response to the crisis our communities have had. You know, we've seen more of this in Atlanta, in Oakland, in Los Angeles. And I think we as a community institution really need to look at what can we do to continue cultivating and, and supporting these type of allyships um, and, and fight the type of historical racism practices that have continue to divide these communities for so long. Uh, I think we as health centers can contribute a lot to that if we can figure out how to do it well. You should know that this conversation could have gone on and on. We clearly had some very powerful messages. And while health centers still struggle with challenges, realize that we are not alone. We have these esteemed civil rights leaders as partners and allies. Jeff Caballero, Marjorie Innocent, and Janet Murguia, our deepest appreciation to you. And thanks to the NAC webinar support team for their work as well. As Ted mentioned earlier, the Agricultural Worker Health Conference is coming up, so make sure to register. It'll be happening May 4th through the 6th. We have some exciting seminars, webinars going on through, through those sessions, so make sure to join us. As NAC celebrates its 50th anniversary this year, these monthly webinars offer an opportunity to highlight the impact community health centers are making every day across America, especially in this time when we are still fighting COVID. NAC is honored to represent the voices of over 30 million patients, 1,400 nonprofit community health centers with over 10,000 sites, 253 staff, and 12,000 community and consumer board members. Remember, we stand strong when we stand together. Thank you for attending. Please join us next month on May 25th at 2 p.m. Eastern time for our next webinar. Have a nice evening.